this course will be <laughs> this course will be a little more relaxed than the other courses we've offered in the past if you've been here. So the first thing I was gonna say is surprise, no mandatory homework. So before, at least in the last session, we did give you guys homework each week. Um, this time it's gonna be like every day back to back for two weeks, right? And there's gonna be no homework. So just pay attention during the classes and it's not really a lot of pressure for you guys. And since it's gonna be like a more fun camp format of a class. So there's gonna be a lot of more hands-on activities as you will see today with our lesson. Oh, by the way, our lesson is fractals today. I don't think I showed you the title slide. And our theme is things you might not have learned in school. So I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I ever learned about fractals in school. And a lot of other topics will also be things that are usually not taught in like a school curriculum. So it'll be more fun and interesting. Uh, okay. Should I say this too? Sure. Um, okay, I guess I can explain our general expectations. So participating is obviously important. Um, we love to hear your voices, so unmute or um, type in the chat if you want to and ask questions whenever you can or like feel the need to. So we are all gonna be very welcoming of all questions. And then be respectful to your us teachers and then also to your peers. Um, this is like the judgment free so no judging. And expect to be challenged. So there are gonna be times when problems or certain concepts will be a little challenging, especially for our younger students, but um, you are going to be challenged, but enjoy the challenge and try to do your best whenever you uh, like encounter one. And also we are going to have a point system. So um, what this means is that basically as people participate or turn on their cameras, unmute, ask questions, answer our questions, or do well in certain activities or like cahoots, other, you know, competition type of things. Whenever we do that, we will give out points. And um, it's not like 100% for sure what the prize will be yet, but expect there to be a reward for whoever, like not one person, like the top few people that get the most points. Um, turning on cameras is four points when we feel like it. Like it. <laughs> if um, everybody has it on, then like we can't really give it to everybody, but it'll be based on what, yeah. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so as Kayan was saying, today's topic is going to be about fractals. So does, has anybody like heard about fractals before? No. No. A couple. Of, it looks like a couple of people maybe have heard about it before. Um, what do you think they are? What What might you guys predict fractals are? So I see one person said that it's a closed shape with an infinite perimeter, which some fractals do have that property. So. Um, a fractal, um, there's three things that make a fractal a fractal. So there's three properties. So the first property is self-similarity, um, which is, um, we'll, we'll define these in the next couple of slides. So the first property is self-similarity. The second property is called infinitely complex. So that means there's a, they have, they, they, their scale goes on to an infinite level. And the third property is called dimensionality. And we'll talk about these three things and look at examples of them in the next few slides. So, oh, Sean, you can go. Okay, so self-similarity is when a shape is made of smaller versions of itself. So as you can see, this is the Sierpinski triangle. And um, you can see that there are triangles that keep getting smaller and smaller. But if you were to zoom in, 
it would look similar to what it is right now. And so um, something interesting is just that like they're going to be infinitely complex. So no matter how much you zoom in and zoom in, um, you're just going to continue to see that pattern in the fractal, um, which we're going to explore a bit in a minute as one of the fun activities. And finally, dimensionality is a way to basically measure how the detail changes in a fractal as you zoom in. So um, for example, um, it's sort of like a way to like describe how it fills up the space around it. So a line, as you probably know, a line is one dimensional because it only goes in one direction. It has no um, width or height, it just has length. Um, and a square is 2D because it has length and width, so it has two dimensions. And finally, you guys know that a cube is three-dimensional, so it would have a dimensionality of three. However, you, dimension, you can also um, quantify the dimensionality of other fractals. For example, the Sierpinski triangle, which you saw, um, has a dimensionality of 1.585. That doesn't mean that this is like 1.585d like it's it's not like what dimensionality is like how it fills up the space around it so like a square is like completely closed and so it takes up like the entire like 2d plane right you can in fact represent a plane with a square it's just that um the serpinski triangle um it's more complex than a line so it's not just like one dimensional but it's also not it doesn't take up the same amount of space as a square so that's why it has um, a dimensionality value between a line and a square. Another example is the Koch curve, which is what part of what makes up the Koch snowflake. So the Koch curve um, has a dimensionality of 1.26. And you might notice that that's a little bit closer to a line, a line's dimensionality than to a Sierpinski triangle. And that's be because um, you can see the Koch curve is more similar to a line than it is to a square. So this is one way that you can describe um, how a fractal looks like and um, how it takes up the space around it. And if, if some of you guys were wondering like how exactly you calculate these values, um, there is a link where you can look at that. It's a little bit more complex than, than we can cover on this lesson. But if you want to, we'll post slides later and you can take a look at how you calculate it. And it does involve logarithms. All right, so we are going to explore um, the Mandelbrot, hopefully I'm saying that right, set using these links. So it's like one example of a fractal. So let's see, I think I will give you this first link in the chat. There. Okay, so just take like a couple of minutes to um, explore this link. So you can see it on my screen too. But with this link, what you can do is basically change the max number of iterations and then um, change the like, colors too if you want to. So I don't know. I think I like, well, these are like really trippy. I liked the one with the black background, this one. And you can just like um, keep zooming in with your mouse. I guess and um, at the bottom corner it tells you like when it's done rendering basically. So just keep zooming in and while you do this think about these questions. So can you find examples of self-similarity um, like infinitely complex like complexity and then dimensionality while you look at this fractal? And also, if you do that, um, tell me what you think this fractal's dimensionality is, the numbers we just talked about. And you can type that in the chat, or you can unmute and explain why you think it's like that. 
Uh oh, the pixel stopped loading. That's not good. Um, I'll do it on my screen too, I guess. There is a limit to how far you can zoom just because computers can't like zoom infinitely, unfortunately. So there is a limit after which everything will look, it won't be as detailed anymore. Yeah, it kind of does hurt your eyes. I see some like really good observations in the chat. In like about mm, one minute, I think we can go back and then like talk about it. Okay, so I think hopefully you've had enough time to sort of explore like the three uh, properties of fractals. So now if we go back, um, okay. So I think I saw something that somebody put in the like a chat about the self-similarity examples. So somebody was talking about how, let me scroll up. The big snowflake slash blob has smaller versions of itself around the shape. And yeah, so as we keep zooming in, um, the same shape sort of appears like again and again, just smaller. But this itself is like reflected within itself, I guess. So that's what self similarity is. And um, somebody, I think, talked about the infinitely complex property. So yeah, like it allows to repeat forever. So although our computers do have their limits, even like we just keep zooming in and there's just more and more that sort of just repeating over and over again. And our final question about dimensionality. So what do you think is this fractal's dimensionality? And why? So far we've sort of talked about like 1D and then 2D and um, 3D it would be like a Q. Since we didn't really learn like fully how to calculate it, you don't have to like have a sure answer. You could just take a guess.
just FYI, this would be like when we give out points, you know, if somebody like at least makes a guess or even gets it right. Okay. Oh, I see two answers that are the same. 2.3, 2.6. Hmm, okay. Well, a 3D shape would be like taking up. So instead of, I guess like for me, I would imagine it would be like actually jumping off of the page, having it three dimensions. But this is more just flat, I guess, like on a one plane. Okay, I see some one point somethings too. Yeah, some people are pretty close. Okay. I think a lot of people are guessing somewhere around our answer. <gasps> Wait, I think I saw the right answer. Um, I think Rishi got it right the first. Wait, Amy, is that the first right it answer? Was, it was um, wait, it was the average. And then it was showed. Yep. So the answer is actually two. And um, I think if you go back to that link that was on the other side, you can like actually find out how to calculate it. But yeah, just it's just like a property of this Mandelbrot set. Okay, now we're gonna move on to some problems using math. Okay, so um, the first fractal, what um, fraction of this triangle is shaded for the first one, for the first triangle? And you could just write the answer in the chat. Yeah, it's one. And so what fraction is shaded for the second triangle? Yeah. And so this next one might be a little harder. So what fraction is shaded for that one? And try to put it in exponent form because that's how you would understand it for the third triangle. So the answer is nine over 16, but the way you would think about it is it's three fourths to the second power. And so for the next triangle, what fraction of that is shaded? Yeah, so every time you go fourth, you just add, um, you raise it to another power. Can somebody explain why it's like that? Why we're raising it to like higher exponents of three fourths? Because it's a pattern. Um, true, it multiplies by itself, um, I guess so, sort of. The way I like to think about it is kind of, if you go from like, um, let's say this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the second step to the third step, oh, I think I see the right answer. Um, okay, that's like, a way to think about it. But for me, so going from the second step to the third step, each of these like triangles um, that are shaded, so there are like three fourths of the triangle shaded, um, each of these also gets three fourths of a shaded. So that's why you multiply it by like three fourths each time. And then here, the smaller triangles are also getting broken up into fourths, and then three of them are shaded. So each time it's like each three fourths is multiplied into another, like is shaded, is three fourths of a three fourths is shaded. So that's why. Um, this is an interesting fractal called the Sierpinski carpet. So it's sort of like the Sierpinski triangle, which Ruth talked about in the last slide, except now it's like a bunch of squares. So for this one, 
what fraction of the first um, Sierpinski trying or Sierpinski carpet carpet shaded? Yeah, so eight ninths of this is shaded, and you can think about it because there's like um, this is made. This is essentially like a three by three square, and only the middle part is unshaded. So that would be eight ninths. So what fraction of the second one would be shaded? Yeah, you guys are catching on to the pattern. So for this one, it would be eight ninths squared. And if you think about what Kayam talked about in the last slide, each time um, another one of those eight of the nine shaded squares is like undergoing like the shading process ish thing. So each time eight ninths of the previous one would be shaded again. So it would be eight ninths squared. So what would be the third one? Yeah, it would be eight ninths cubed because again, it's that pattern. So we don't actually need to count each of the squares. And so finally for the last one, how, what fraction would be shaded? To the fourth power because it's just a pattern. And this is where you can see some of those properties of fractals. So you can sort of see how there's self-similarity because the big shape is made up of a bunch of smaller copies of itself. And each of these states in, in real life, a real like um, true Sierpinski carpet, there would be an infinite number of stages. So there would be so much detail, you wouldn't be able to zoom in on all of it, but we can't to, like actually make that much detail. So we typically just show the first few steps in the fractal. Now for um, the next fractal, which is called the Apollonian net. So what this one involves is first a big circle, and then you have um, smaller circles drawn in it. And these circles are tangent to each other, which means that they're just like the edges are touching, but they're not going to intersect. And then they're gonna just keep filling up the space and getting smaller and smaller. So um, a question kind of related to this shape, say the big circle has a radius of four. Um, then what is the area of the region that's inside the big circle, but outside of the circles labeled two? So basically just focus on the big circle and then the circles that have two written in them. And think about how we would find the area of the region that's not there. I don't want can you say that again, Anikit? Um, so when you said the, the uh, largest circle has a radius of four, do you mean this entire circle? Yep. Okay. So let's think about what kind of strategy we could use. Like, for example, we could go find the area of every single circle that's not one of the two that we mentioned, and then try to add up all of those areas. But that's kind of hard, right? So we're going to pick an easier route. Um, what we can do OK, I think I see some correct answers. What we can do is we can take the area of the larger circle and subtract away the circles that are labeled 2. So first of all, um, yeah, yeah. And then we notice that the radius of the smaller circles is going to be two because it's half of the bigger circle. So first of all, the bigger circle has a radius of four. So what is the area of just the bigger circle, the biggest circle? Sixteen pi, yep, because that would be um, pi r squared. And then what is the area of the circle labeled two? Exactly, that'd be four pi, because the radius of the circle labeled two is two. And so um, pi r squared would be four pi. And then there's going to be two of the circles labeled two. So we would multiply four pi times two, and then we get 16 pi minus eight pi, which equals eight pi, as um, a few of you said. So good job.
<laughs> there's two sides. And if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask in the chat or out loud at any time. All right, so now we are going to do our second activity. So this is going to be making a fractal on your computer. So I'm going to like do a demonstration on Microsoft Paint. And if you want to, you can follow along or for now you can just watch and try it again, like try it in your own time. So you can see that, right? Okay. Oh, wait, are you sharing? Are you sharing paint? Yes. Oh, we can't see that. Oh. I can still see like activity number two. Okay. Um, hold on. Can you see now? Okay. Yeah. There we go. So I'm going to just like uh go away. Okay. I'm going to go down to like the middle-ish and zoom all the way in. Hopefully you guys can see this right now. Okay, so I'm gonna use this little pencil and draw a line with three pixels. So one, two, three. Okay, and then using the transparent selection, I'm just going to select it in like a roughly square shape and then copy it and then rotate it right 90 degrees. Then I'm going to attach it to kind of like, you can think of it as the end-ish of my um, other step, the step before it. So right now the only step there is just the line. So I'm going to attach it to this end right here and one pixel will overlap. Then I'm just going to keep copying it and then rotating it and attaching it. So, so far, it doesn't really look like anything. It actually just looks like uh, um, maybe said this look, look like a staple, and I agree. Doesn't really look like much, but I'm just going to keep copying it and seeing what happens as I sort of attach it in this pattern. So to me, it still doesn't really seem like anything like a fractal, at least not like the ones we've seen yet. But as I go further and further, I think I'm starting to see some sort of a pattern. So guys, I'm making a fractal, by the way. Okay, move, there we go. Oh no, where'd it go, okay. Is that my brain? Um, maybe. And when you do this, uh, at least for me, it was like really confusing how to do it at first, but basically you're trying to connect the ends together. And, oh no, it went away again. Okay. I'm just going to not look at the chat. So hopefully you guys aren't like saying anything really important. No, it keeps going away. And when it's too big, you can always just zoom out. Mm -hmm. 
this shape ever going to become a closed shape? Um, actually, no, I don't think so. It's like going to be, well, it's all like the drawn in a continuous line, but I don't think it becomes a closed shape. I don't no, know. This doesn't, the one this, that this doesn't connect together. It's just like. <laughs> oh no, it went away. Okay, there you go. Yeah, you could continue to like make it more and more complicated. You would be able to see. It looks like. What do you guys think this looks like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, that's what I think. Looks like somebody fucked. Oh no. See, the problem with this is that as you go further, sometimes I don't know exactly know why the shapes keep like cutting off as I rotate. Yeah, make it like more squarish. Okay, you guys probably can't see the intricate details anymore, but just for the sake of this working. I'm going to have to zoom up. And if you guys don't have Microsoft Paint, um, I'm sure there's other websites you can probably look at to like generate your own fractals and stuff like that. You might be able to also try this in Photoshop, although I'm not really sure how well Photoshop works. Oh, no. If you have a Mac, I'm sure there's probably something you can use that does something similar. The problem is that for me to connect it, I need to zoom back in. Yeah. After it gets big, it's a little bit hard. But yeah, you guys get the idea, right? I think I sort of see like the same. I'm not sure what this is. To me, it looks like a robot's face for some reason, or like a spider's face. <laughs> the same thing repeating over and over again. And as we zoom in, we kind of can just like see that. Yeah. It's <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Just, Where did it go? Control D a couple of times. Uh, oh, so this is basically a never. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I can it. also. Do you, Kaya, do you want to do another curve or do you, or do you want me to do another curve or do you want to move on? Um. Do you guys want to see another one? A famous yeah. One. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to let Here. Amy do this because I might screw that up. <laughs> okay, you guys should try to guess what this curve is because I think you guys might be able to recognize it. It's kind of a famous curve. Okay, so we're going to start off basically the same way as before with the three little pixels. Um, and then we're going to make a transparent selection. We're going to duplicate it. And then rotate 90 degrees, and then we attach it. So we're starting off almost exactly the same way, except now instead of attaching it to the bottom here, where you, you can like make a symmetrical shape, we're gonna make we're gonna attach it to the other side here. So now it's not gonna be symmetrical anymore. Does anyone have any guesses yet? I know there isn't too much to go off of yet. Oop, I think I messed up. Okay, let's go back a couple. Yeah, it does look like a tangled rope right now. Oops, I think I messed up, hold on. Okay, I will try again. Just a disclaimer, the one I did is probably like the easiest one to do. Everything else is like super uh, complicated. <laughs> okay, you know what? I might just need to restart because I think I messed something up somewhere. 
Okay, there we go. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah, so you can just make like a fractal from copy and pasting certain things just over and over again. Yeah, as long as you try to follow a pattern when you make it. Because that's basically what it is though. It's still a little hard to see the shape of the curve yet, but if you may start to recognize it as it grows bigger. Uh oh, got cut off. Dang it. It does look like waves. Do you guys want a hint? Oh, I think I see it. Yeah, Sri Ram got it. This is the dragon curve. Do any of you guys like Jurassic Park? Yeah, so the book Jurassic Park had this curve in it. Um, it was like that one math, math dude, like he was like talking about like, how they, like, I don't know. I don't really exactly remember what he was talking about, but he was, it was like a chaos theory guy. And he was like, and like there was like this fractal in the book. So yeah, I think this is, so now, now you can definitely see the curve. So you can sort of see how like there's this big curve and then there's like these smaller versions of the curve like within it. Yes, there is a book. I think the book is pretty good. Okay. Kaya, you can start sharing the slides again. One second. Okay, can you see? Yeah. All right. So fractals in nature. Okay. So um one example of fractals in nature is like plants, specifically broccoli. So we have a question, uh, a math question. Mike has to eat broccoli for dinner, which he hates. First he eats half his broccoli, then he eats a third of what remains. What fraction of his dinner does he still need to eat? Two sixths. Um, remember that it says he eats a third of what remains, not a third of the original. Two six guys. Also, make sure you Be like careful guy. your answer. Yeah. It was two six. Okay, so I see a lot of people getting it. So at first you all said one six because you probably thought one half plus one third is five six and then you subtracted that from one, but that's not what the question was, right? So wait, I can write this one or draw this up. So pretend this is Mike's dinner, right? So first he eats half of his broccoli, which would be like this much. Um, right, wait, hold on, let me make that better. Um, okay, so basically he'd be eating around this much, right? Um, and this we know is one half, right? So we have one half here, and then he eats one third of what remains. So right now what remains is one half. So if he eats one third of that, that's one sixth, 
right? So he basically eats this much um, ish. And that would be um, one sixth, right? So one half plus one sixth is four sixths or two thirds, right? So one minus four sixths or two thirds is equal to one third. So yeah, make sure to read the question when you are given that. Okay, I can also do this question. So cloud A is twice as big as cloud B, and cloud B is three times as big as cloud C. How much bigger is cloud A compared to cloud C? Okay, so I'm saying a lot of correct answers. So I shall um, help. Right, so um, say this is cloud A, right? So cloud A is twice as big as cloud B. So cloud B would be like this much, right? And then cloud C is, um, or cloud B is three times as big as cloud C. So cloud C would be like this much, right? So essentially what we're doing is um, two times three, which is just six. Um, so six is our answer. Okay, and now for ferns. So at the beginning of day one, a fern is six centimeters long. And during the day, it grows five centimeters, but at night, some animal comes and eats two centimeters from it. How many full days will have passed after the fern becomes 15 centimeters long for the first time? Now you gotta be careful in this one. It's a little bit tricky. Full days and then, um, so far there aren't any right answers yet. I don't know if you guys have heard a similar one about like a snail crawling up a well or something, but it kind of ends earlier than you think. Okay, yeah, we have our first right answer. Um, are you raising your hand to say something or just like, okay. Yeah, so the correct answer is two. Oh, and what is the point of points? We are going to send physical like prizes for people with um, the most points. So very exciting. Um, you guys should all participate a lot. Like what? We will probably announce it next class. Okay, so let's go back to this problem. So first day, we start at six centimeters. And then during the day, it grows five centimeters. So six plus five. Um, at the night of the first day, it goes down by two centimeters, so minus two. So we have six plus five minus two. So at the end of the first day, we have um, that it's nine centimeters long. And then day two, we add five centimeters of growth. And then at night, we subtract two centimeters from the animal. So we have 12 centimeters. And then on the third day, um, it grows five centimeters. And so then it ends up at 17. So it's already longer than 15 centimeters. And we can completely ignore the night because it just says um, after the fern becomes 15 centimeters long for the first time. So only part of the third day passed. And so the answer would be that two full days have passed. Yes. Okay. So another place where you might find fractals in nature is in flowers. So um, let's just say that like red flowers, like the number of petals they have, ha will have to be like a multiple of four. 
So that would mean like red flowers could have like four petals, eight flowers, eight, pe eight, eight petals, 16 petals, stuff like that. However, a white flower um, has to have petals that are in multiple six. So they would have to have like six petals, 12 petals, et cetera. And let's just say flowers can't have more than 100 petals. So let's say like a pink flower, which is kind of like red and white, um, has to obey all of these rules. Then what's the most number of petals a pink flower could have? Yeah, I see lots of people putting the correct answer. So what this question is essentially asking is that it's asking for the, um, what's it called? It's asking for a multiple that is a number that is a multiple of four and six and has less, that and is less than a hundred. So um, in order for a number to be a multiple of four and six, all it has to do is just be a multiple of 12 because 12 um, is, a multi is the smallest number that's a multiple four and a multiple of six. So um, then in that case, um, the biggest um, multiple of 12 that is less than 100 is um, 96. So the answer to this would be that pink flowers can have at most 96 petals. So good job, everyone. Um, okay, so now we're doing snowflakes. So the question is, no, snowflakes are falling at a rate of 45 snowflakes per second. And after two and a half minutes, how many snowflakes are on the ground? Uh, so yeah, so people are getting the right answer. So basically, you would convert two and a half minutes to seconds. So that would be 2.5 times 60. And you would get 150. And then you would multiply that by 45 and get 6,750. And that's the answer. Another, another place where you might find fractals is when you're looking at trees. So a forest is made up of many trees and a tree is made up of many leaves. So you could consider it like a fractal. So let's say that there's um, a forest, right? And the number of trees in a forest is growing by like 2% each year. And so if the forest started off with 300 trees, after how many years will there be at least 330 trees? So for this, you can use a calculator because um, it's a little bit difficult to do without a calculator. I mean, you could still do it without a calculator. It's just, you know. Yeah, it looks like people are getting it. So um, for this, um, for this question, um, each year, um, the number of tr trees is increasing by 2%. So the first, it, it starts off with 300 trees and the next year there will be 2% more. So how do you get something 2% more? Well, you multiply by um, 1.02 because that will, um, that, that's how you, um, that's, that represents a 2% growth. So each year, you multiply for, for the number of years that pass, you multiply by 1.02 until there are at least 330 trees. And so if, if you know logarithms, you could use logarithms for this, but I'm just gonna manually multiply them out because I don't know if you guys know logarithms or not. So 330 times 1.02, and that's, that's, that would be a growth after the first year. So that would, that would mean that there are 336.6 trees after one year. And then you, because it's growing 2% each year, then you multiply that value you got 
by 1.02 again. And so that would give you, um, oh, wait a second. Or wait, sorry. There we go. So after one year of growth, there would be 306 trees. No, I, I was starting it from 330. So after one year of growth, you would have 306 trees. And then you multiply by 1.02 again for the second year to get um, around 312 trees. So then the third year you get around 318 trees. Fourth year, you get 325 trees. And then in the fifth year, you actually pass 330 trees. So the fifth year would be the first year where there are more than 330 trees. So it would be five. It's still titled trees. It should be lightning. I guess I can do this one as well then. So another place you can find fractals in nature is in lightning, like the way it branches out as it comes down. So let's just say like there's like a big field and there's a pole in the middle of the field. And the chance of you being struck by lightning is based on the distance you are from the pole. Um, so if you're like, if you're, let's just say, if you're two feet from the pole, then the chance of being struck could be one over two. If you're three feet from the pole, um, the, the um, chance of you being struck by lightning would be one a third. So um, what is the area of the region where there is a greater than 20% chance of being struck by lightning? And remember that this field is flat. So you need to take in the area around the pole. So it, it's not just um, a linear, like, don't think of it as a, as a number line. Think of it as like a coordinate plane and there's a pole at the or, origin. And we're going to ignore the fact that if you are closer than one foot from the pole and there seems to be a greater than um, one 100 percent chance that you're going to get struck by lightning for that we're just going to say if you're less than one foot from the pole then you're guaranteed to get struck by lightning okay if, if you're a little bit confused think about it like this um, you have a field, right? And the field is flat. Um, and there's a pole in the middle of the field. Think about it like you're viewing it from a bird's eye view straight down. So in the middle of the field, there's a pole, which we're gonna just represent by dot. And basically, if you're closer than five feet from the pole, then your chance of getting struck by lightning is greater than 20% because 20% is just one fifth. So um, this means that there is, a circular region around the pole where you're less than five feet um, from the pole. And so if you're within that region, which is a circle, then there you have So that means that you're basically finding this the area of this circle here, which has a radius of five. So what would be, um, this is a funny thing. So actually, since the question says there is a greater chance than 20% chance of being struck by lightning, that means that if you were just standing on the edge of that circle, technically that wouldn't count as being part of the circle. But as soon as you stepped in like 4.9999999 feet, then it, you would um, be considered like part of that greater than 20% chance. So in that case, we just consider the border of the circle. So you would just include the border of the circle because it's a line. So it wouldn't really, it wouldn't matter in the calculation. So the answer, you would just use um, five as the radius of the circle. And so the answer would be 25 pi. Yeah. So in things like these where it's like the inside region counts, but the border doesn't count, you just ignore 
you just ignore it because it doesn't really change your calculation. It's still 25 pi. All right, rivers. I think this is our last problem before we do a really fun hands-on activity. So um, a boat is traveling a distance of 16 miles in two hours and 30 minutes. And what is the speed of the boat in miles per hour? So this is a pretty simple question. I'm just going to wait a little bit for answers. And for this question, um, you can put your answer in like a decimal form. So something point something, that would be good. Okay, I see a lot of right answers, I think. Mm -hmm. Unless I did the math wrong. I think that's right. All right, so let's see. If you travel 16 miles in two hours and 30 minutes, um, I'm just gonna think about two hours and 30 minutes, kind of like 2.5 hours, because you know, 30 minutes is half of an hour. So if you travel 16 miles in 2.5 hours, then in one hour, um, you're going to travel 6.4 miles. So to get that, you could just like divide 16 by 2.5. But yeah. Pretty simple. Uh, so that answer would be 6.4 miles per hour, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So now we're going to do um, an activity, and you guys are actually going to need some materials. So you're going to want to get a piece of paper. Copy paper works just fine, as well as scissors. And if you want, you can get a pencil, but um, you don't have to. So um, we are making some things, but in my opinion, it's cooler than a snowflake. It's not a snowflake. So get the materials and let me know when, type in the chat once you guys come back with like these materials, because you probably have to get up and you get it. Yeah, we'll give you like a couple of minutes. Yeah, you can go and get paper. I don't know if you have like random paper. Like it doesn't have to be like clean copy paper. Like, like has it's okay to have like writing all over it. And you can, once you like to get up and get paper, you can just type that you're back in the chat. Yeah, just paper, scissors, you need scissors, paper and scissors. Pencil's optional, but recommended. I suggest going to the top right corner and then changing the view to side-by-side -side speaker. Okay, does anyone need more time getting like materials? Okay, I think we can get started then. So first, um, what we're gonna do is um, we're going to take our paper and we're gonna fold it hamburger style. So this means that we are folding it um, like this, like a, like a book. So you're gonna just fold it in half like that. And so now you sort of have a book. 
And so once you do that, then if you have a, if you want to use a pencil, you can use a pencil because that makes it easier when you cut. So um, you're going to draw a lot, like make sure you're um, drawing it from the side that's like the fold here. So you're going to draw a line from the middle of this side to just the middle of the paper. If you don't have a pencil, you can just mentally do it. But I will draw the line just to show you. So, so now I have a line here. So notice how I'm not cutting the side that's open. I'm cutting the side that's like the spine of the book. And then you just cut along that line, but don't like cut all the way. Only cut until you reach the middle of the paper here. So you'll end up having something like this where it's like you can unfold it and look at it and stuff like that. Um, but this side, which is the spine, is like here. Yes, you should cut both of the pages together. Yes, yeah, cut it together. Okay, um, are you guys ready to move on to the next step? I'm gonna assume that's the yes. Okay, so the next step is that you take um, this and you, oh, actually we already cut it. So technically we already did that. Step. So next we're, what we're gonna do is that we're just gonna like fold this the top, like the top sec, the just the top flap here, we're gonna fold it like this. And just like fold it in half. And the reason why we're folding it half is because then we're gonna do a little weird thing. Oh wait, this step is showing. So once you fold it in half, what you're gonna do, is you're gonna then unfold it. And then you're gonna do something weird. And this is a step that might trip you up. So Basically, you sort of open your paper a little bit, right? Just a little bit. And then you take your top flap here and then you push it backwards into the thing so that it ends up looking like this. Oh. If you messed up, just get a new piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. You guys need to look at it again. So make sure that you're back into like this full, like full size paper here, like, or not full size, just like, the hamburger fold. It's just that you've cut it and you've added a crease vertically here. And then what you do is that you open like the back up a little bit and then you push this into the middle part. So it's kind of hard to show you on the screen, but basically here, I'll show you this way. So it's like this. And then you go, whoop. Uh, so what will this look like again? What? Uh, so like what will like this um this um origami paper clustering um look like? In the end, it'll be um a kind of a three D serpentine triangle thing. Oh okay, thanks. Yeah. Can Just I do this? Right? Like, like uh, you were supposed to fold it in. Hold on, hold it, hold it up a little higher. Yes, like that's that? correct. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Wait. So is this like how we're supposed to? I'm completely confused right now. Like, um, I don't know if I'm showing it. Hold on, I will have to change it to the speaker. Wait, who is who is asking? Adika. Adika. Okay. Um, are you like? Is your camera on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so right now it looks like you've okay. So now unfold it. I think you can unfold it yeah yeah now now what you want to do is like push it into the thing so you want to push it backwards into it like 
this? Uh, make sure like it's sort of like in between the two. Oh. Okay. So this this isn't like a normal fold. This is sort of like a um weird thing. You can also look at advanced the origami fold. <laughs> Actually, if once if you manage to push it in, so I'll I'll, sh I'll sh do another demonstration. So you have like the paper here, right? So some of you are just like doing a normal fold. And that's part of it. So what you do is like you do a normal fold and then you push it into the thing. So you push it inside. It's a little bit hard. It might not go in the first time, but you you want to make it so that there's a stair step. You see how it's a stair step here? And there's a stair step here. And the paper that used to be sticking out from here is now like in between. Like I'll show you the top down view as well. So you have it like this. Previously, you had it like this. And then you want to push it inside. So it's kind of like stacking it on top of one another, right? Yeah. So now it's a stair step pattern. This is the hardest step, by the way. But once you master the step, then you can make the whole thing. So is anyone still confused? If you are confused, I will continue to demonstrate until you're not confused anymore. These papers are Can not you taped. Can show it again? Yes. So you were probably here um, in this step. And so you can like fold it to the side a couple of times just to like give it a vertical crease here. And then what you do is that um, you push it, like you invert it, you basically, so you, you push it inside. Obviously, if we were in person, I could actually go around and help you, but <laughs> just, we're just going to have to make the best out of this. Um, does anyone need more help? Uh, fold it hot dog style and then push it in. Um, I, I, the push it in part is correct. So you sort of, it's folded here and then you, you kind of push the top flap in. So then like that. Okay. So it looks like people are asking for the next step. So we I guess we can go into the next step. So now we're basically going to repeat this pattern. Um, if you have a pencil, I would recommend like looking at the stair step pattern, um, drawing a line where you need to draw it. So you draw it in the halfway point of each step and draw it halfway across the step. So it will be like this. So this line is being drawn halfway and it goes halfway. This line is being drawn halfway up and it's going halfway across. Make sure at the bottom like step, you don't go like all the way to the half, like. Yeah, don't draw it all the way out here. You only want to go halfway, like the step width. So halfway here, just a little line. Just like look at the picture on the slides and I think it should help you. Yeah. Do we just draw the lines or do we cut there? Yeah, then you will cut the lines. As long as you don't, the, the reason why you're drawing the lines is that way so you don't cut all the way because if you cut all the way, then it, it might not work out. So now I've cut each of the lines so you can sort of see it's like halfway. And then we're gonna do the same thing we did in the previous step. Each, each of the top halves, we're gonna do the inverting thing. So this like flap up here, we're gonna, in these two flaps actually, there are two flaps here. We're gonna invert each of them. And then this flap here, we're also going to invert. So I will do it in front of the camera so you guys can see. Okay, I'm just creasing it a little just so it makes it easier. So now if you can, you can see there is a vertical crease here. It just makes it easier when I actually do it in. And so 
So here's the paper again. And it's, it will probably look something like this right now. And so you're gonna take this one and push it inside. Then you're gonna take this one, we're gonna push it inside. So now you see it's kind of becoming more of a staircase. And then you do the same thing down here. So and so if, if you complete this step, you'll have like this staircase here. And if you open it up, a little bit, um, it doesn't look like too much right now. If you do it one more time though, then you will start to see the Sierpinski pattern emerging. So is anyone still a little bit confused? Um, So this, um, now you do it again, you go on each of the stairs, you draw a line that goes halfway. And then on the next one, you do a line that goes halfway and on all the stairs and then you cut on each of those lines. So I will do that real quick. So we have our lines drawn. And then you cut each of the lines. So now you can see they're able to be folded. So now we do the same thing where we like invert each of them. So you'll actually, this step, you'll be inverting a lot of flaps. So um, this may take a little while. Does anyone, is anyone a little lost? Yeah, um, can you help me? Like, yeah. how do you invert the top flap, like this one? I'm still on yeah. the last step, so okay. I need to invert that I need to invert this yeah so um wait could you hold it up sideways like a staircase okay so you take one of the flaps and you you can like sort of open the paper up a little bit so um and then you take you take one of the ones you're trying to invert and you push it in backwards so I can show you so what flap goes in the like so it's one of the flaps that have a fold on it. So here, I will show you. So, okay, ignore like the other lines. So this, if you're, so if this is sort of like what you, so at the top, you probably have two flaps, right? Do you have two of these? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you would invert each of them separately. So push each of them like into the, like, I guess backwards into the thing that they're like attached to, so. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, like it should look like a staircase, right? Yeah, it should look like a staircase yeah. once you've inverted everything. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So currently mine is like a four step staircase. Is everyone like, is, okay. Mine is like an eight foot staircase. Eight foot? Not eight foot, like as a stairs. A yeah, lot of stairs. If, it, if it looks like stairs, then it's probably right. It looks super cool. This is what it's like when you're further along.
if you messed it up, you guys can always um, do this again because we will post these slides. So you can um, <laughs> you can like try it again if you want to in your own time. So is it just gonna be like an infinitely tall staircase if you if you keep folding it? Um, it won't be infinitely tall, but if you keep folding, the height will stay the same, but it'll become there'll be more and more steps. So each step will be yeah, smaller. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So what is this supposed to demonstrate? So basically, this is sort of shows you another way to make a fractal. So. Oh, that looks so weird. So this is um, what it might start to look like. So um, this is here, maybe this will, this is a Sierpinski triangle. So this is a Sierpinski triangle fractal. So this is, you're basically acting as, wow, okay, that looks pretty good. So this is acting at, you're acting as like the algorithm for making the fractal. You're like do, making like the self-similarity thing because you're, you're repeating the same action over and over again to make the fractal. And each time you do one of those like um, folds, like each time you make it, each time you make like another step, like you're making it more complex and you're adding another iteration to the fractal. So if you continue doing this, or like maybe if you use a like larger paper, um, then you can make it um, even more complex. And you can also do other things with it. Like um, for example, if you make three of them, you can make a, yeah, once, if you're, if you're done, if you like have a bunch of steps and you don't want to make any more, you can open it a little bit and you can look at the triangle. If you make three of them, what you can do is that you can like put them together in like a little Sierpinski tetrahedron, which I think is pretty cool. So you look at that. Are you just holding it with your finger or did you connect them? Um, I connected three. I was not expecting this at all. If some of I know some of you guys probably got a little bit lost. So if you want to, um, you we we have directions on the slides that you can try to follow as well. If you guys want to show us what you have so far, that would be really great. Oh, and because I actually like yours a lot. I think it looks. This is mine. I think it looks like it's right. Ooh, yeah. so yours is really good. Wow. It's kind of like a. It'll it'll look weird at first, but once you do a few like iterations, then it will start to look more like a Sierpinski triangle. Wow, some of your, yours looks great too. That's okay, yours didn't turn out too great. You can always do another one. After a while, it becomes a little bit harder to cut. So using a larger paper would be probably Okay, we're almost done. This is what mine looks like. Ooh, that looks pretty good. Um, also, it's like almost the end of class, but before you guys go, uh, if you're not done with your fractal, obviously you can keep making it, but um, you're quote unquote homework, I guess. It's not mandatory, obviously, but if you can look for fractals in your house or in nature. So we talked about some examples in the problems like trees, rivers, even broccoli. And um, if you find other examples, 
affect those uh, in your house or like in your backyard or something, then if you take a picture of it and upload it to the stream, obviously we might consider it for points. And also it'll just be cool to see. Um, so yeah, you can take pictures of whatever you think is a fractal. So a tree would obviously, yeah, would work. And you guys are free to go. So yeah, thank you for showing us your fractals, guys. I think it all looked really good. Thank you. Yep, bye, have a good day. Bye. 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 Tomorrow. I